What is up, Generals? We are Fiasco back with Ultimate General Civil War, and this is the Confederate Major General campaign. We are heading into the Battle of First Bull Run, or First, or sorry, yeah, First Manassas Junction. Um, blah, 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 Newport News, men are in good condition, have enough supply. Yeah, we didn't really inflict a lot of casualties in that fight, so that's true. The Union's numbers have been allowed to get kind of out of control. Don't worry. We're going to we're gonna sort of undo the damage with regard to that going into first bull run. Their training is still hovering in the 18-ish percent, so it's gone up about 2% since the last battle. Their numbers have gone up a lot. I mean, they were uh, like 40, I think, at the end of the average of 40, and now they're average of 47. So that's a significant jump. Uh, the armory, however, hasn't really moved, so it's still 1842s and the like. Um as a small reduction to enemy army size and yeah, uh, let's just get into it. So like you've, like you've usually seen, I'm going to do the preamble here and then I'll record on the day of you defend your forest here and the numbers are small compared to what we're seeing in, um, you know, the union campaign in the late war, the numbers are small. Like this is a division of mine or not a division. This is a core of mine. And now that's the entirety of the force you bring, um, to the battle of the first bull or a first bull run. So, uh, yeah, uh, I will see you guys in the video and on obviously as far as you're concerned, a few seconds later, I'll start talking. So we'll see you then. Fiasco signing out for right now. Start. Uh, so they do the thing that they kind of always do where we get this really great kind of rundown uh, about the battle. And I, I'm probably, I probably did talk about this in the same manner um, with the Union video. And I suppose uh, there is the danger of uh, sort of double dipping on content. Um, when I talk about uh, these these major battles, because obviously I will have already talked about it. Uh, from the Union perspective. And um, after uh, Bull Run, you can probably expect that I'll do one battle of each campaign um, for each, uh, well, each campaign. Um, hmm. Sorry, I meant to say uh, thing unit of time, not thing thing. So uh, that's constructing English sentences for you there. Uh, one battle each. Uh, from the Confederate and Union campaign until uh, I bring the Union campaign to the conclusion of the war. Um, it's predominantly because I don't want to get myself distracted. Uh, and Sorry, they're distracted discussing the Confederate plan. Hold the river crossings. That's the Confederate plan. Um, however, uh, they don't have the men uh, on site to do that. Uh, so you kind of have to make do. Um Let's talk about my, my battle plan for my tiny portion, my little my my division of uh of this force. I think I'm real fancy. I and and you know um, when I, I'm watching this and kind of thinking about it in retrospect, and I think I was I am on to something, but there's um a, a an implement implementation um gaff on my part. So I post, um, first artillery, which is three inch guns, um, in this position right there with the intention of promoting them or de denoting them exclusively for counter battery work and, uh, to shoot the union artillery. Um, and they do good in that regard. The problem is that my understanding about the Union artillery targeting logic is they will target the closest unit or the closest threat in line of sight in that I deployed the way that I deployed my units, that was the artillery unit. You look at 3rd Infantry, 3rd Infantry's skirmishers are not deployed, so I could easily have split 3rd Infantry's skirmishers off and put them in front of uh, the artillery unit there and or, or fuck even the skirmishers from first infantry like all i needed them there was to just to, to generate line of sight so i think if you're playing the confederate campaign and you come along to this battle this is not a terrible plan 
putting a unit here for counter battery work, especially um, a gun like the rifled gun guns, like a Trediger or uh, a three inch ordnance or you know a, a parrot. Um, I don't think you, you I don't think you can buy enough parrots to use them in this battle, but you get the idea of what I'm getting at. Um, and you put a unit of skirmishers out in front of it so that they're the ones getting shot at. That would be far better than what I've done here because I've already lost 50 men out of this unit and they're just going to keep taking losses. Uh, so a thing to think about for the future, um, I have to baby this unit from the rest of the battle because now I'm worried about, you know... Um, them getting wiped and losing the experience and everything like that. So uh, there, there's a misstep, definitely. You see, and, and I even kind of figured out, like, what if I got these skirmishers over here and then the artillery starts shooting at the skirmishers, even though there's a, a weakened artillery unit um, available for shooting right there. Uh, and so it's just kind of, it's it's frustrating how close I was to a really good idea and, you know, just, just not quite. Uh, but... Two, two brigades of infantry is more than enough to defend the bridge, uh, especially if they've got uh, 1841s or any kind of rifled weapon. If you were, uh, I don't know if there were enough Lorenzes to support uh, a large brigade, but you could probably squeeze a smaller, like, 700-man mm, brigade of Lorenzes out um, if you were so inclined. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily worth it, but, you know, that's certainly a thing you could do. Uh... I send the infantry running and then I advance the infant then I advance my infantry to try and get some volleys off on their artillery. Uh, again, the big focus is counter battery, counter battery, counter battery. Uh, I want to make sure that the union is left with um, lose lose decisions, you know, cross either either stay where stay where they're at uh, on their side of the bridge and do nothing or and or get shelled. Uh, or risk um, an expensive crossing from a manpower perspective uh, where, you know, two rifled units with decent accuracy stats are just going to tear them to pieces. The um, left portion of my, my line is intended to maintain uh, my division's position on this sort of peninsula. It's not really a peninsula, but this, this, little arm of land that we're currently deployed on is intended to maintain their position as long as possible. And so I've got B and the other unit, um, Barto, uh, deployed in, um, defending blocking terrain or whatever, checking terrain in order to, you know, hold them off. But I don't, I wasn't banking on Burnside, uh, already being at the unit cap of 2950 this early in the campaign. It makes sense. Um, and imagine it happens uh, here uh, at Bull Run 1 and also Shiloh uh, because there's such a huge presence of allied troops and the, the game doesn't or can't scale, I guess you could say down, to, uh, to match what you've got going on. So my experience in the Union campaign later on uh, is that the AI actually does a pretty good job of keeping the game design, the, the this is really frustrating, um, they do a really good job of keeping the game design to a point where the units scale to match you, and it's it's a lot of fun um, in that you're fighting units of similar-ish size, even if they're better equipped or better led or whatever. Um, that's really frustrating that the unit was able to make it across the bridge there, second Ohio, and engage in melee combat, because now I have to babysit uh, that unit in the corner, and now it's a lot harder for me to uh, guarantee that I can... Um, block someone off at the bridge uh so i mean you know it's an it's a, a you adapt you keep your plan flexible and uh, you understand that the enemy is going to do whatever they can to screw you um but b is right now just buying time um i have no expectation that b would obviously be able to hold off burnside interestingly in this position the enemy ai is actually kind of screwing itself uh because there's two skirmisher units deployed side by side that almost perfectly block the frontage of Burnside's uh, brigade. And as a result, um, B is engaged in a firefight with two skirmisher units, one of whom is nearly morale shocked. 
versus the volley fire that Burnside would be able to put out. And once one or both of them gets um, routed off, Burnside's free to do whatever he wants to do and then, you know, shit gets real for B <laughs> real quick. However, by the time that happens, <clears throat> the map's expanded and um, uh, pretty rapidly at this point, I'm like, okay, now we need to see if we can't get lucky and get one more good devastating volley off and the guy's trying to cross the bridge. And then we need to set up our position uh, on Henry Hill. Um, which is to say we're going to use that farmhouse and these this sort of triangle of trees to make a small uh, fortress of sorts. Um, I've always kind of envisioned trying to catch the Union in the river as they uh, approach from the west um, and uh, catch them in the river and see if I can't hold the entirety of this side of the river. Um, maybe if I ran them, I could do it, I suppose, but, uh, I, I never manage it and it's always just, it's always touch and go, but we do manage to hold this side of where, where the Hampton or Hamilton Legion, Hampton Legion, whatever, where, where Beauregard is, um, Beauregard's troops there. So Bartow and the Hampton Legion do a wonderful job holding up Burnside. Uh, they catch him in the river. They, they just ream these units. Um, it, by the fact that he's, you know, 3,000 men, he just manages to sort of press a, across by sheer uh, b- brute force. I mean, you know, sheer bullheaded uh, willpower, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, all you're doing at this juncture is trying to slow down the Union by yourself time. Slow down the Union. Get yourself... Um, some degree of situated in in so far as your troops on the Henry Hill side of this river uh, are, are mostly in position, and you're ready to repulse or or at least meet, check whatever the advance of um the union i get one or two more good volleys on the guys trying to cross this bridge here but they do eventually kind of overpower me even though they're taking so much damage to do so so it's it's worth it to try and stick it out for the extra couple volleys especially if you can wipe you know one of that cav unit or something um but but pretty quickly you want to think about okay when when's a when when's a good time that i can get my guys safely extricated from that position and back uh, on my side of the river and and usually it's when the Union's busy routing off the bridge is is when you want to try and do it. Uh, This gets really messy trying to hold off Burnside and then also damage Franklin and everything else. And I'm I'm still not sure, kind of watching it play out, whether it was the smart smart play to um, ultimately retreat with Stonewall Jackson's command um, or to uh, press the attack on the river. So uh, I was this close to making contact with Union troops, but they had, they had, I think they, they had outflanked me and they had made um, a foothold of of note on uh, the Henry Hill side of the river on the Confederate left. And so like, I wasn't going to be able to trade as efficiently as I would like in that um, situation to make kind of make the casualties worth it. And so as a result, I decided, okay, we're going to fall back to the tree line and we're going to go with the kind of more defensive strategy. So, so you can kind of play this battle very aggressive and, and try and catch the Union in the river as often as possible. Uh, and you can get great, great results if you do that. I, I managed to pull that off in my Brigadier General campaign. Uh, but you can't really do it as well in Major General. The units are just too large, and I would imagine the same largely applies it. Um Legendary. So Sheridan or Sherman, probably Sherman, um, manages to get across the river. And uh, so now I'm worried about how am I going to pull back? And and the answer is I'm going to flank Sherman, get him to that morale shock state, and then and then basically beat feet. Um, get a good solid volley in and then get out of there. Because even though... Um, two 800-ish man 
Confederate brigades with one star and rifled muskets are going to significantly outshoot Sherman's um, 3,000 man brigade. Uh, he's going to have that staying power and the ability to hold on in a, in a way that even though my volleys are more devastating shot for shot than his are, I just can't afford those kinds of casualties. And uh, yeah, so the other thing that is kind of of note is uh, I made the comment earlier that um, in the very first episode, the Panda mod doesn't change the in-game behaviors uh, of some of these units. And I think that, that having watched some of his most recent videos, that appears to be inaccurate. Um, and I apologize for that. So in the vanilla game files, um, units over a certain size experience some pretty crippling efficiency penalties associated with that size. In the case of infantry, it's infantry larger than 1650, cannon larger than 14 guns, um, skirmishers or uh, carbine cavalry larger than 375 individuals and melee cavalry, cavalry did not suffer. Um, any efficiency penalty associated with size. Having removed that from the game, so in the in the in the base game, facing off against these three thousand man Union brigades would actually be kind of a good thing because their units would just be fighting very ineffectively, and they would just stand there doing little in terms of offensive output on their end, but just taking all kinds of damage. Um, the change now means that they the some of that negative scaling has been removed. My understanding is that some of it's still there. I don't remember the exact figures, and Panda Kraut's one of my viewers, so I'm sure he can leave a comment to that effect. But um, the scaling is either lessened or removed. The the penalty to set scaling is either lessened or removed um, as you as a function of increasing the size of the the unit. So. Uh, Artillery batteries in the 18, 20 gun range, 24 gun range are going to be performing, you know, well. Um, I, I don't know if it's a if it's a linear improvement. Um, so, you know, X additional guns always always relates to Y additional firepower or if it's logarithmic or parabolic where um adding guns has uh, diminishing returns and they're just not quite as strong as they, they were in the base game. Because the base game, you still got better damage in a larger battery, but you, you suffered diminishing returns to the point that it became um, nonsensical to make batteries larger than 14 uh, or maybe 16 at a pinch if you knew you were going to be taking a lot of casualties. So like a six pound battery or a, 12, a Napoleon battery. Um, so I don't know if, if, if Panda Mods just reduced the impact of um, the diminishing returns or if he's removed the impact of the diminishing returns. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to him to leave a comment. So that that is um, a, a thing that you need to be aware of watching this series. If you're playing an unmodified game, some of the behavior from units larger than um, 1650 in the case of infantry, 14 in the case of guns, etc., so forth and so on, they're going to behave differently in my game than they would in your otherwise un, unmodified game. So just be aware of that. Um, and you're watching what's happening on the screen. It occurs to me as well that I've not talked about at all what's happening <laughs> in the battle. Um, so the, the aggressive version of this battle, you meet, the conf you meet the Union as they're crossing the river and then stop them in the river if you can. The defensive variant is you utilize this triangle of trees as kind of a bastion or a fort and you fight off the union now the danger is that you can be outflanked as i am currently being to to the south of my position by uh, porter however by the time the flanker units get into position it's been my general experience not that i can prove this that you will have had johnston's um division core whatever johnston's collection of units um join your battle before that really gets off the ground and you can outflank the outflankers and uh 
and and then you can you can transition into the offensive. And the way that this battle generally flows is you're buying time, you're buying time, you're buying time, you're buying time, you're getting yourself in a position, you're uti- utilizing terrain to your advantage whenever possible, and then once Joe Johnston shows up, you can transition pretty immediately to the offensive. Um, and what's cool about that is game stuff aside, that's a lot of how the battle actually developed is um, Stonewall. I think he fought closer to the river in real life, but but Stonewall, you know, holds uh, as best he can. He's outnumbered, he's out outmaneuvered and everything else. And the Union in that battle was continuously moving and trying to find the flank, but they weren't they weren't moving very effectively. Um, and really, frankly, neither side was moving very effectively. Communication protocol or any of that stuff wasn't really in place yet. <clears throat> the armies themselves had not learned the craft of war, so these soldiers. Um, and, and so units arrived pell-mell, kind of like they're doing here on, in this game. Um, and uh, it, it's this is a... a fairly decent in terms of recreating the kind of flow of that battle with, you know, with the caveat that it's a video game and, and probably some things are a little easier or whatever, but yeah, like, every time I'm almost outflanked, I've got reinforcements to cover down on the flank that would be outflanked and it's just, it's just kind of how that went in real life, too. Um, so I've got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd infantry now kind of anchoring the right portion of my flank turning the Union flank well, all of the um, AI troopers are eating the brunt of the f- of the the fighting. Uh, Johnston's division, or, or he's he, they don't put division commanders on the map, so I have to assume this is Johnston's core finger quotes. But there's five brigades of infantry, so it sounds an awful lot like division to me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I've got my infantry kind of turned in the flank. I've got. Um, my artillery unit kind of slowly advancing, but I'm babying it because I was an idiot in terms of how I utilized it earlier. I think, again, I think it was a good idea. I think if I'd screened that artillery unit better with a, a skirmisher, um, detached skirmisher, I'm convinced it would have been a gangbusters idea. But, you know, I guess we'll never, I, I'll, I'll know it it's at some juncture when I replay this battle, but between now and then, whatever. Um... Johnston's turn to the Union right flank, and uh, Fiasco, Rebel Fiasco's troopers are turning the Union left. Those two things together are kind of collapsing the Union position backwards in on itself, and um, we're going to trap uh, the Union at uh, this farmhouse right across the the crossing right now where uh, McDowell's kind of currently running back to. Um, I did an unnecessary kind of long loop with 5th Virginia and the Hampton Legion. Uh, sometimes there is Union artillery on the other side of the bridge that we were holding earlier in this battle. I like to catch them by the flank. Um, and 5th Virginia and Hampton Legion were both so small that I didn't mind not having them in the front line. Uh, but I ended up not running into artillery this time. I usually do, so... Maybe maybe the counter battery fire did work in that regard, um, but uh, yeah. So this is I think kind of the best way you can play this battle um, from the com- perspective of someone trying to approach uh, the Confederate Major General campaign, and, and I, I, really any battle where you have access to a large number of Allied troops is to have the Allied troops handling the brunt of the fighting. And then have your men pushing in someone's flank. Uh, and that's just an efficiency and conservation of force thing. You don't get to keep any of the soldiers that come from the Allied brigades that are under your command. But you do get to keep, obviously, your soldiers and the experience they generate and everything else. The units they capture, the guns they capture, so forth and so on. I mean, you get to keep your own. Like, If Allied brigades capture someone, you get to keep that too. So don't, don't think of that like... If uh, Stonewall's units are the ones that uh, capture someone, you don't get those. It's not like that. But um, 
this is an opportunity for you to milk a lot of experience and get your units up to a good place where leading into the Shiloh campaign, you have, um, you know, some, just some good units. I, I think, uh, I think in Panic Routes version of this battle, he ended up getting a second star on one of these units, which is just bonkers, but I mean, totally believable. Um, first of all, he's got some very tight, good gameplay. But, but secondly, just, you know, second, Confederate infantry and Confederate experience generally, the Confederate units, like, their big, their big shtick is the quality of their raw recruit and ergo everything that comes with it is just better. So you're dealing with material advantages that are made up with quality, made up by way of qualitative advantages in the, in the, the manpower. Now, we can have a whole different discussion on whether or not I feel like that's, you know, borne out by reality that is absolutely the perception that is absolutely the like common common image is that the union soldier was of lesser quality than his confederate um confederate equal and the, and the fact that many battles saw a, a major numeric um differential uh between the C the army of northern virginia and the army of the potomac uh and yet the confederates were very successful in numerous cases that can be attributed to a number of factors beyond the quality of the individual recruit um however it's also undeniable that if most of the industry and most of the arms manufacturing and most of the farming and everything else was being done in the north you know what was the southerner doing <laughs> they weren't just sitting around twiddling their thumbs they must have been doing something so farming and hunting and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's very integral to that culture. Now it's very integral to that culture then. And so presumably it seems likely to me that, you know, your average Southerner would be more confident or comfortable with a musket or a firearm or whatever. But, you know, accounts of the, of the era show that um, Union and Confederate soldiers both bitched plenty about being drilled and marching and, you know, heat and uncomfortable footwear and bad sleep conditions. So I don't get the impression that they were like happy, <laughs> happy to march or something, happy to drill or train or whatever. Uh, so, you know, I think on, on that level, I'm not entirely sure that's a difference, but um, in the game, the differential is definitely numeric and, and um, quantitative on the union side, especially with regard to access to artillery and um, qualitative on the side of the Confederates. But again, if you capture or kill a lot of Union infantry and artillery, you should have plenty, plenty of weapons and plenty of things. And they, they may, you know, not be the new fi shiny fancy shit, but I, I have no reason to believe that I shouldn't be able to have just as many 24 pounders on this playthrough as I'd like to have, um, as I do in the Union playthrough. Now, I probably have to capture a good number of my parrot guns, but we'll see. We'll see. Anywho, um, this is the wrapping up stages of the battle. Uh, you, you know, once Johnson rolls in, you can turn the flanks and then you can use your troops the same. And that's pretty much bull run It's just buy time, um, until all your dudes show up and then turn their flanks and then bingo, bango, they're going to, they're going to end up here. Um, I didn't go in for the kill because I wanted my guys to get more accuracy and more experience that way. And uh, that'll be it. So we're going to route the last unit here in a second. We're going to take a look at the casualty screen and see how everything went. All right. So we inflict a little over 20,000 just on... And I didn't... Oh, damn it. I'm sorry. I didn't see my own casualty figures, but I'm sure they were you know, not terrible. Uh, lots of promotions. I don't know how many of them are mine. Unfortunately, we capture a whole bunch of palmettos, which is cool. We capture, um, Springfield 42s, which will be nice for chaff. I guess we capture, um, a bunch of six pounders and then we, re we, we recover, um, one stupidly utilized three inch artillery. So there's that. Uh, we get, Jackson, we gain a core, we gain a medal, presumably for playing on this difficulty, because I don't think I got one before, and we get a bunch of recruits, which is cool. Um, we, uh, we're taking a look at what's coming up. We've knocked down the size of the Union Army from, I think, 50 before this started to 
you know, now that, and then we're heading into uh, prep for uh, the campaign leading up to Shiloh. But for Shiloh, we need to pretty rapidly scale up the army. We need to get up to, you know, Army Org 5 at least to get um, 20 men or 20, 20 brigades in the core, um, or maybe even six. I'm not sure. Uh, the units are all looking pretty good though, all things considered. So there's that to consider. Um, and I'm still not sure how many men I need. So yeah, I think I put the two points into army org and if I don't, I'm mad at myself, but I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah, I think I do. We're just debating why. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically the rest of that. That's all she wrote for for uh, first bull run. Hold until hold until Johnson arrives. Turn the flank. Put him in the river and shoot him down. Um, there's also other more aggressive ways you can do this, but I I like this method. It's uh, methodical, if nothing else. So um, remember, screen your artillery. I don't know why I didn't do it this time, but screen your artillery. Uh, with that being said, I hope you guys had a great time. This is a really fun battle, especially the Confederate side, because it's a great opportunity to get a bunch of resources. Uh, but I'll see you guys in the next one. This is Fiasco, signing out.